there. At uh, this time, I want to have uh, Jan come up and uh, share with us a little bit about Operation Christmas Child. Good morning. It's time to start thinking about Christmas. Well, Operation Christmas Child. For those of you that aren't familiar with Operation Christmas Child, it's part of Franklin Graham's Samaritan's Purse. We pack shoe boxes with gift items such as school supplies, hygiene items, stuffed animals and toys for children in war-torn, poverty-stricken, um, devastated areas of the world. With the shoebox, the child is given a booklet. I think you can see it. Oh, there. They're handed a booklet in their own language called The Greatest Gift of All that tells them about Jesus and how much he loves them. The shoebox shows them how much they're cared about. The children are then invited to a 12-week discipleship program where they learn more about the Bible and how to share their love for Jesus. A shoebox makes a big impact on that child. I don't know what I'm doing. But even more than that, we are told that each shoebox touches the minimum of 10 people's lives. Here at Cavalry Chapel, Kaneohe, last year we packed 5,875 shoeboxes. That means that you, we, this church, had an impact on 58,000 people's lives without even leaving Kaneohe, all because we packed those shoe boxes. Some of the members of our church hold packing parties, so if you'd rather donate items than pack a shoe box, we will keep a donation box over by the information table. This month, we're collecting uh, school supplies. <laughs> Thanks. And um, we do because this is the time of year that we have the best sales. For example, this notebook that's normally $1.99 at Walmart right now is only 17 cents. And crayons are 25 cents. So the more we save, the more shoeboxes we can pack, right? And the more children that we can bless. There are pamphlets over on the information table and um, a list of suggested items. We also have a table out in the courtyard, so come talk to us and get more information if you'd like. We have a short video that says far more than words can. So together again this year, let's make a different kind of Christmas for needy children, as many as we can. God bless you all. I'd like to show you the video at this time. the table out there in the front. Uh, if you'd like more information, you uh, 
are certainly encouraged to stop by uh, before you leave today, and they'd be more than happy to talk with you about it. Uh, I did forget one thing. I did this first service too, and uh, that's the upcoming uh, primaries, which are not on the date that you're about to see on the screen because I got the date wrong. Uh, I've been known to make mistakes on occasion, and if you'd like to know about those, you can talk to my wife. She'd be more than happy to tell you all about them. Uh, and let me just get this down here. And we don't know where it went, so how are we going to do this? How about we do this? We just say that. All right. So it is not on August 7th. The primaries are on August 9th. What? Oh, you changed it. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. I really appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> so it is the date that's on the screen. The primaries are on August 9th, and we don't have any more of the uh, <clears throat> Hawaii Family Forum voters' guides available, but you can go to hawaiifamilyforum.org, and uh, <clears throat> you can download the... Uh, PDF file. It's a four-page PDF file that shows you where all of the candidates uh, stand on the issues, at least those that responded to uh, the survey. It's really important, I think, this year especially that we uh, educate ourselves and, and uh, get informed for this year's election. Very important, I think, for the state of Hawaii uh, this year. Hey, let's get into the Word of God. On Sunday mornings, we're going through 1 Corinthians chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And today, we're only going to take one verse again, verse 2 of chapter 4. Uh, but we'll, for the sake of context, begin uh, reading in verse 1. What I'll have you do is once you find your way there, if you're able, uh, stand, follow along with me. If not, that's all right. Uh, I'll begin reading in verse 1, and we'll read through to verse 2. The Apostle Paul is by the Holy Spirit writing and says, verse 1, So then, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now, verse 2, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Let's pray. We'll ask God's blessing on our understanding. If you would join with me. Loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to you for your word. Lord, we're so thankful for the Holy Spirit that gives us eyes to see what it is that you want to show us in your word. Lord, that's why we're here today. We want to hear you speak into our lives through your word today. So Lord, when you do, will you give us ears to hear? and hearts to receive. We don't want to miss anything that you have for us here this morning. So Lord, keep anything away that would keep us away from hearing that still small voice, voice of the Holy Spirit when you speak. So Lord, speak. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Today's teaching is part two of a series I've titled, Getting Up When You're Knocked Down. As I mentioned last week, I chose this title chiefly because to me, the Apostle Paul is a great example when it comes to somebody continuing to get back up every time they were knocked down. And if there was ever anybody in the scriptures that was continually knocked down, it was the Apostle Paul from multiple shipwrecks to numerous beatings and everything in between, he not only survived, he actually even thrived in spite of it all. We get that autobiographical statement in the book of Acts where he says that nothing moves him, nothing shakes him, that he's just steady and ready for all that's coming against him. As such, I think the question before us today is, what was his secret? What was Paul's secret? What was it about him that enabled him to keep getting back up and even with almost more of a sanctified resolve, keep pressing on? I would submit that the answer to the question is 
woven into the fabric of the chapter that we have before us today. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> we saw the first one last week in verse 1, and the paramount importance of it can never be understated because it, re it is so important to understand the foundational nature of it. In other words, if we don't get this first one right at the root, then there's not going to be any fruit from the rest that follow this first one. And what I'm speaking of is, <coughs> pardon me, humility. <coughs> pardon me. Simply put, it's that of maintaining a servant's humility. Here Paul says, first and foremost, that men should always regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. And what he's saying here is that this is what we should be known for, known by, and regarded as. We need to, when people are talking about us or referring to us, what needs to come up in that conversation is that we're servants of Christ that are humble in heart. Servants like the under rowers of that day, which is the word that the Apostle Paul uses instead of the more common one, doulos, meaning bond slave. He uses a word that carries with it the idea of an under rower who had the lowest position on the ship, a position so low that it would require an attitude of humility in order to survive. And this actually dovetails into our second one, which is what we're going to look at today here in verse 2. And, okay, thank you so much. Excuse me. <laughs> I have someone that has given a cup of water to the least of these here, so let me just... Paul, in effect, is taking it a step further, and he says, in addition to the humility of a servant, it also requires that those who have been given this trust must prove that they are faithful as stewards. So you have humble servants and faithful stewards that go together. In other words, what comes packaged with one possessing the humility of a servant is the understanding of what it means to be a steward. Well, what does it mean to be a steward? Well, if you prefer uh, a manager, perhaps better said, but the steward or the manager is the owner of nothing and the manager of everything that they've been entrusted by the owner of everything. And notice that the one requirement is that they must be proven faithful. This is one of those places in God's Word where we would do well to really first notice what it is that the text is not saying. What is Paul not saying here? Notice he does not say that a servant or a steward must prove themselves successful. He says they must prove themselves faithful. You'll forgive the silliness of the illustration, but can you imagine on that great and final day when we see the Lord, Him saying to us, well done, good and successful servant, enter in. Again, I know that might sound silly, but there is such an importance in understanding the distinction here, the difference here. And I would even venture to say that understanding that difference is a game changer. Understanding the difference between being successful and being faithful. I'll even take it a step further and say that if we're under that notion of needing to be successful, then we'll have considerable difficulty continuing to get back up every time the world or the flesh or the devil knocks us down. Let me explain what I mean by that. If the litmus test is that of my being successful as opposed to my being faithful, then what's the point? Why even try? Every time I fail or fall, why, why even get back up and try again? I'm just continually 
failing and, and falling. Actually, I'm in good company with the likes of the prophet Jeremiah, who by any stretch of the imagination was faithful, but I don't think that he would have been seen as being successful. He didn't even have one convert. He was called the, <coughs> pardon me, the weeping prophet. <coughs> Not one person responded to one of his altar calls. <coughs> I am so sorry about this cough. <coughs> it wasn't as bad first service. You should have come to first service. <laughs> But contrast the prophet Jeremiah with the prophet Jonah. By any stretch of the imagination, he would have been considered anything but faithful. But I guess you could have seen him as being successful. He not only had you know, one person respond to his altar call, he had an entire nation repent. I mean, if you really think about it, who are you going to invite to speak at a pastor's conference? Jonah or Jeremiah? Right? Who, who's the one that's had the greater degree of success, at least as it's defined by the world? And that's the problem, isn't it? Now think about this. How was Jeremiah able to continue? <coughs> Can we pray? Lord, can you just get me through this? second service today after second service it's okay if I cough the rest of the day just get me through this part Lord can you just soothe in my throat so that I'm able to speak so it's not a distraction in Jesus name Amen <coughs> fisherman's friend that's what I have thank you I, have, I brought extra I don't leave home with that these days Again, getting back to our contrast between a Jeremiah and a Jonah. Wouldn't you agree that if it depended on Jeremiah's being successful instead of faithful, that we wouldn't be reading about the prophet Jeremiah? In other words, that was not the requirement, which is why he was able to continue getting up and never give up. And this is really our second secret to how it is that we too can continue to press on as servants and stewards of the Lord as we endure as unto the Lord. Perhaps better said we're able to endure all that comes against us because we know who we're doing it for. We're doing it as unto the Lord and not as unto man and aren't you glad by the way I mean what happens is as humble servants and faithful stewards we're gonna endure hardship for the Lord that we would not endure for just anybody anybody else not even ourselves we will do things for the Lord we will put up with things knowing that it's for the Lord because all he requires is that we're faithful not successful Man requires that we're successful. Man looks at the outward gauge of success. And it's equated with the numbers. And so you look at a Jonah, and by the world standard of success, he was very successful. But was he faithful? No. Jeremiah, the world standards, was he successful? No. Was he faithful? Absolutely. And that's the point of what Paul is saying is it requires only that we are faithful and not successful. To me, this is the common denominator between the likes of an Apostle Paul and a prophet Jeremiah. <clears throat> if you were to ask me what I thought was one of the biggest downfalls, and I, a pun is intended by, by saying that, this would probably have to be it. 
And what I mean by that is that oftentimes when we're knocked down and even kept down, it's because we have this mindset of what I'll call the success of self. Let me say that again. The mindset of the success of self. In other words, the onus is on us to be successful instead of the pressure not being on us just to be faithful. And therein lies the difference and that's why it's such a game changer. Let me say it this way. If I do it for self, then the onus is on me to be successful. And if I do accomplish some measure of success, I'm going to take pride and ownership in that which I've accomplished. And that's the antithesis of the mindset of a humble servant and a faithful steward who instead will do it as unto the Lord and not as unto man. And see, here's the problem. When it's as unto man, then I'm all of a sudden now going to be a man pleaser in order to be successful in the eyes of man. And it comes at the expense of being a God pleaser and instead being faithful in the eyes of God. In other words, on one side of the table, I have the man pleasing dynamic of being successful. And on the other side, I have the God pleasing dynamic of being faithful. And they're polar opposite. And if I'm living on this side of the table, then there's no wonder my Christian life is so up and down. It's so riddled with failure and success, so back and forth, so defeated and frustrated because I'm not able to continue to press on. I'm operating under that success mindset. To me, this is why the Gospels are replete with Jesus teaching parable after parable where he contrasts the faithful and the unfaithful steward. And when they're get called to give an account of what they've been entrusted with by the master, what's rewarded is not how successful they were, but how faithful they were. And it's really interesting to note that the reward for the faithful servant was that of being entrusted with even more. Sometimes from that which was originally given to the unfaithful servant. Consider Luke's gospel, the 16th chapter. I'll read verses 10 through 12. Jesus is speaking. He says, who, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit you to your trust the true riches and if you have not been faithful in what is another man's who will give you what is your own now consider this as well three chapters later in Luke 19 verses 20 through 26 when the wicked servant servant is called to give an account it says verse 20 then another servant came and said sir here is your mina or pound depending on your translation I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I come back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. Sir, they said, he already has 10. Interesting. He replied, verse 26, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. Okay, stay with me on this. I find it interesting that the wicked servant has what was entrusted to him completely taken away from him and given to the faithful servant. I also find it interesting that this came at the protest of those in the parable who questioned why the master would give it to the one who already had ten. 
He's already successful enough. He already has 10. He has the most of anybody. Why would you take it from the one who failed and give it to the one who succeeded? That's the problem. It isn't about who's successful or who's failed. It's about who was faithful. The one who was given the 10 and then the one from the one who was not faithful is given that one. Why? Because he's successful? No. Because he's faithful. Pastor, you're beating a dead horse. Well, I'm going to continue to beat that horse, so hang on. <laughs> and there's a good reason for it. I find it interesting that it wasn't based on the servant being successful or unsuccessful. That was not the gauge by which their faithfulness was measured. It was based on whether they were faithful or unfaithful. Now here's the question. Why was the unfaithful servant so afraid? I would suggest that he feared failure because he was operating in the success mentality. He was not operating in the faithfulness mentality. And see, that's our problem. We operate in fear. What is the antithesis of fear? Faith. Instead of faithfulness, it's fearfulness. And that was his downfall. That's what took him down. That's why he was unfaithful. Because he was operating in the success and failure realm instead of the faithful realm as a, as a servant, as a steward. And I find it really interesting that he would say, in effect, that the master is so powerful he doesn't need to sow anymore. He's already so successful. And then the faithful servant is then given even more. In other words, you reap where you don't sow. You've already got enough. Again, it's evidence that it was this mindset of the success of self, and it's evidenced by his fear of failure, which is why he gives the excuse that he gives. If I'm operating in that, that realm, it's just a matter of time before I falter and fail and fall. Whereas, on the other side of it, if I'm faithful, then there's no fear. Faith cannot exist where fear dwells. Here's the bottom line. I'm going to close with this. My faltering comes vis-a-vis -vis fear of failing, whereas my rewarding comes vis-a-vis -vis my faithful stewardship. In other words, knowing that my reward is not based on my success or failure, which creates fear... I'll be propelled by faith to be faithful instead. That's where the bar is. That's where the goalposts are. Let me share with you a personal story. For years I was in the business world in corporate America and owned and operated my own businesses. Before that I enjoyed a successful sales career. <clears throat> One of the hardest things for me to transition from was leaving that mindset when I entered into the ministry. And I had to sort of die to that self that was so, you know, it was so ingrained in me that your self-worth was synonymous with your net worth. That you had to be successful. And early on in my uh, ministry in those early years, I found myself sort of performing and it was a crushing pressure that I placed upon myself in the ministry and it wasn't until the Holy Spirit just ministered to me that what the Lord required of me was not that I be successful in ministry but that I be faithful and boy it just took all the pressure off of me that burden that weight that crushing weight that I was ministering under was no longer there because all of a sudden now I don't have to be successful contrary to what even fellow pastors were telling me oh subtly of course when they would ask me in a roundabout way how big my church was 
is they wanted to compare my church with the size of their church. And they would ask it in you know, ways like this. Hey, how many are you running on Sunday? To which I learned to respond, well, uh, we don't herd cattle. Uh, we uh, feed sheep. And so it's not about nickels and noses. You've heard me say oftentimes that it's not a matter of being a mile wide and only an inch deep numerically. It's a matter of being a mile deep if we're only an inch wide, you know, spiritually and numerically. It's not about the numbers. Is that the gauge? If, if that's the case, then I'm really not looking forward to when the trumpet sounds. Because when I get there, I'm going to be asked to step aside to the, the line, the pastor's line, the small church pastor's line, so they can let all the other big church pastors first enter in. Enter in! <laughs> well done! Wow! Good and successful servant. And here I come up and he said, oh, yeah, Calvary Chapel County. I was that small church. You guys didn't even have your own building for the first 10 years, did you? Yeah, why don't you, can you, why don't you wait over here? We'll get to you in a minute, just to have a seat. Really? I think that a Christian or a pastor who lives like that is to be pitied. It's so needless. We do so unnecessarily. You know how I know I've heard truth? When I'm freed. You know how I know that I've not heard truth? When I'm burdened. Because the truth will set you free. Jesus said, my commands are not burdensome. John, John writes. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, who are weary under the crushing weight of living your Christian life trying to perform and succeed. That's not, that is a matter at all. The only thing that matters is, were you faithful? Were you faithful, pastor, with that small congregation? For all of those years, you were faithful. You stuck with it. And every time you got knocked down, you got back up. You showed up. You preached your heart out. You fed the sheep. You were faithful to the Word of God. You kept the Word of God. You preached the Word of God. You were faithful. When you get to heaven, you know what I think is going to happen? The one that has the big church, I think they're the ones that get to... At least I hope they are anyway. They're the ones that get to go over to the side and have a seat and enter in good and faithful servant. That's all that's required is that we be faithful. And does that not change the dynamic? When I fall, when I fail, I don't succeed. I can get back up because it's not about my success. It's about my faithfulness. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word so much. I thank you for the, the truth. I thank you that your burden is light, that you've not laid upon us this heavy trip, this burdensome weight, this pressure of having to be successful. Thank you, Lord, that all you require of us is that we be faithful. Lord, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen.